Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, friends and family, to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Uh, we are joined today by Tom Beal, who's been in digital marketing even longer than me, which is saying something, and we're going uh, to be hitting him up for some war stories. Uh, Tom is, if you don't know Tom, he's known for having a really uncanny and much sought after ability to help people that have done big, complicated things simplify them so they can do even bigger things. Um, so as I was just telling him, this is going to double as content, but I'm basically going to get free coaching for the next hour. So I'm super excited about this conversation. Tom, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Happy to be here, Jeff. Excited to change some trajectories for the better here during today's conversation. Amen to that. That's why I try to do that with every episode. I, I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I get decent feedback that we're onto something. So um, you, man, there's so many places we could go with your story and your background. Um, I, 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 my, my, stomach is telling me to go with the simplification thing. Um, sure. I think that, you know, I have an entrepreneurial education company. I take a lot of people that have maybe been employees and we start to introduce them to like, Hey, there's this whole world out there where you can take control, take command and be in charge of it all. And being in charge of it all sounds really good until you do it. And then you realize, wait, I'm in charge of it all. Mm -hmm. This is a lot. I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm doing. I'm going over my head. I'm freaking out. Right? So, Maybe start at the beginning, like, how did you become a, quote, simplifier? How did you sure. have a knack for keeping things even simpler than other people, and thus you can help them? All right, so to answer that question, let me just give the brief backstory. So a lot of people don't know me, and that's, that's by design, and we'll talk about that possibly uh, a little bit later. But in essence, prior to being an entrepreneur, I was, as a teenager, well, first of all, I was born to, to teenagers, 17-year-old mother, 19-year-old father, grew up around four divorces and six marriages uh, between my parents. Uh, lots of chaos, lots of challenges, lots of adversity, went to nine different schools by eighth grade in upstate New York and in uh, 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 North Carolina, near Statesville, North Carolina area, uh, and uh, massive amounts of chaos, alcoholism, abuse, neglect, massive drama as a child. But through that, I was a good student and also became someone who excelled in sports. And then as a teenager, I saw the movie Rad, you know, at, at preteen and was like, man, I want to learn how to do those tricks on the bike. So right. somehow, some way, managed to get like all of the family members I could pulled together to get a bike that was properly equipped to do tricks. And that was like a feat in and of itself. That was a massive undertaking because we, we didn't have much uh, financial success in my family. Um, but I, I very quickly uh, went from not knowing how to do anything to becoming a national champion at 15 years old. And with that came some sponsorships. And with that came a neat little lifestyle of where I would tour around with my team and we'd do shows. And we do shows in schools and for parades and for towns and all sorts of fun stuff. And I'd travel around the East Coast uh, competing in competitions. Um, so I was a national bicycle champion. I was a top wrestler uh, and then um, went to college and I liked girls more than I liked school. So I dropped out of college and ended up back in my house with my mom and my two younger sisters. And finally, my mom and I agreed. She was kicking me out and I was leaving. That was the agreement. The problem was I didn't have anywhere to go. Now, I say that where I could have probably called up my aunt and uncle or called up some grandparents, but I didn't want to impose on them. So I pretty much sat in my car wondering where I was going to go. My heart was telling me while I'm in Rochester, New York area to go to New York City, but my mind was telling me that was absolutely ridiculous because I didn't know anyone in New York City and I only had $60 to my name and I had this beat up old 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit. Before you know it, I follow my heart. I'm on the road to a six hour road trip to New York City, nowhere to go. And I wasn't raised religiously, but I was like, hey, God, I heard about you and this might be a good time for me to talk to you because I don't know why I'm going there and if I could get any help, I'd appreciate it. So make the six hour drive, 
uh, fuel up the diesel. It was a diesel Volkswagen Rabbit, no radio. And I said, here's the deal. If I end up living in this car, I'll live in the car. If I end up living on the streets, I'll live on the streets. If I end up dying in New York City, I'll die. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But if I can get some help, that'd be greatly appreciated. Get to New York City. Don't know where I'm going. I come through the, the, the top of Manhattan. Once I get past 125th, I'm looking around. I don't see anything. It's, it's dead. It, it, I left at nine in the, in the evening. I get there at three in the morning and I see a Chinese restaurant with its light on. I pull over, I go in, not because I'm hungry, but because I got nowhere to go. And I sit down at the place, and the waitress comes over. She's like, what do you want? So I'll have some, uh, just some rice, please. She's like, we don't have any rice. So what do you mean you have any rice? Your Chinese restaurant. Uh, long story short, I said, I'm good. I, I went to the bathroom, went back to the car, fired it up, went one block and someone walked in front of my car at the stoplight. And it was someone who I recognized. I rolled the window down, yelled his name. He looked at me and said, what the F are you doing here? I said, what the F are you doing walking the streets at three in the morning? It was my ex stepfather from those divorces and marriages mm. who had recently been married and got in my car and, and said, where are you going? I said, uh, nowhere. Uh, I don't have anywhere to go. And long story short, he ended up having me stay with him. And I stayed with him for three months. And so that's, that's a divine appointment pretty much that uh, it's just crazy how the odds could stack up that at three in the morning I would cross paths with him and all that fun stuff. In, in well, Manhattan, I, I used to live in Manhattan. You don't run into people, you know, <laughs> no, exactly. Right. He was the only one on the streets at that three in the morning. So stay with him. And so I see this meeting that between you and I and those watching as much of a divine appointment as that the odds of us having this conversation are ridiculous, like lottery, like that our crowds pass. And here we are using today's technology and so to, how to answer how the simplification came after becoming the national bicycle champion, after that whole stint staying with my stepfather, I went back to Rochester, New York a few months later, I was working in a factory and I just knew that wasn't the life that was my future. Right. And, and so I had some other uh, interesting paths unfold where next thing you know, I'm in United States Marine Corps boot camp, And I, I, I like quit both my jobs, was in boot camp, and wondering what the heck did I get myself into? And after I was like, I can't get out of here. I might as well make the most of it. I ended up being the number one honor graduate from my platoon after three months. Uh, so uh, my grandparents got to sit next to the base general. Uh, my grandpa was at World War, in World War II at Pearl Harbor. So he's proud to be there, et cetera. So the national bicycle champion, top wrestler, number one honor man from United States Marine Corps boot camp, ended up getting three meritorious promotions in my four years of active duty, some other uh, awards and things like that. Then when I got out, I was number one in five sales organizations in the corporate world. And that's when I got the epiphany to become an entrepreneur. And I was like, shoot, I've been the national bicycle champion. I've been the number one honor man out of boot camp. I've been the top wrestler. I've been number one in five sales organizations. This entrepreneur thing, here, hold my beer, watch this. Right. <laughs> watch this. Let me show you how it's done. And very quickly skidded across the pavement on my face. And what that means is didn't get any success didn't, my dreams didn't come true. And it wasn't that line of success that we see in the, uh, the movies. Uh, you know, it was a real struggle and my mind couldn't grasp that because I was used to winning and winning big at everything that I did. So I pretty much scrapped the plan. Obviously the plan I was doing wasn't working. So I said, okay, so let me go back to some of the things I did as a teenager when I was learning how to ride bikes. What was the secret that led me to becoming a national champion? ding, 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 going to people who were already experts, right? Going to people who already were doing the things that I want to be doing. What helped me become the top wrestler? Ding, ding, ding. I went to the three-week Dan Gable intensive wrestling camp in Iowa. I went to two weeks here. I went to two weeks there. I went to go work with the best of the best. Mm -hmm. That got me from being mediocre to being really darn good. What helped me uh, be that top Marine? When I was in boot camp, this was all new to me. I'm like, I'm like a fish out of water. But I saw people who their whole life were dreaming of being in the Marine Corps and they did know how to drill. They did know how to give the salute. They did know all that stuff. So I had them mentor me and guide me. And then the same thing in corporate America. When I got into each of those five uh, corporations, I was like, show me who the number one salesperson is. Pretty soon I'm going to be number one. And what I do, I learn from that number one person. What were they doing? How were they doing it? And, and I took it and added my own uh, commitment, dedication, and, and perseverance to it, and very quickly was number one. The reason I went to five different corporations, because when I got to the top, the view wasn't what I thought it was going to be. You ever had that experience, Jeff? You're like, all right, I made it to the top. You're like, Man, I thought the view would be much more grandiose than it actually was. 
And I wasn't living the life that I thought I'd be living when I reached that pinnacle. So, I, oh wait, that grass looks greener. Let me jump over there and very quickly to the top. So when I got to the entrepreneurial world, I figured I, I already know this stuff. Obviously, I'll do it on my own. And so after skidding across the pavement on my face, AKA losing huge amounts of money in, in trial and error and not having any success, I was like, let me go back to the basics, which are find out who are the people who are the experts and pretty much like, look, here's where I am. I'm not getting the results that I thought I was going to be getting. What am I doing wrong? How can I get the results that you're getting? And that's where I tap back into all the other uh, ways that led me to success. So the first one of simplification is throw out the idea that I'm going to make my own wheel. I'm going to build, I'm going to go build my own car. How about that? Look, like, look, there's already car companies out there. You, yes, could you build a new car? Absolutely. Is it the best use of your time? Probably not. Is it going to suck? Probably, right? So go to the people who already are achieving the results that you would like to be achieving and get the guidance. Now, it's easy in today's day and age, easier than it was back then. So this is back in the early 2000s when this journey began for me. So 2001, 2002 timeframe. So I bought Corey Rudel's Internet Marketing Center program, yeah. IMC Center way back, you know, and, and that's where, uh, you know, uh, Nitty Gr Jermaine Griggs, I saw Jermaine Griggs, 2001, 2002, yeah. working with Corey Rudel and stuff like that in the videos, bought that, bought a couple other things. And then was like, all right, I got to get to live events. So that was my first recognition of, I'm not doing it on my own. Let me go where the people are and surround myself with people who are achieving the results I want to achieve. And then you can't just go up and latch on. You have to be able to deliver some value, right? There has to be a you know, it's just like when you buy anything, you give them money and they give you that in return. So it's like many times I, I hired a lot of mentors, but other times I worked out some deals like, look, here's what I'll do for you. And here's what you can do for me. And together we both win. And in doing so, I became friends with some of the best known internet marketers in the early 2000s, 2004, 2005, et cetera. And we, uh, I teamed up with Mike Filsame. And so Mike and I from 2006 to 2011 did numerous million dollar product launches, numerous live events, spoke on stages all over the world, impacted, we had email lists in the hundreds of thousands, impacted positively thousands of lives uh, in that time frame, and produced results in the tens of millions of dollars. And lived, you know, uh, a life that I've also learned lessons. I was financially illiterate growing up around uh, no money. All of a sudden you get money. Now I very much understand and, and have empathy for the athletes who are given these huge paydays and people are like, well, how dare they not have any money? Like, well, you try it. It's not that hard <laughs> to right. make huge amounts of money, not knowing anything about it, being financially literate. It goes out just as fast as it comes in. Now we have some good memories. We have some good times. I had some good assets and things like that, but uh, it's been one crazy journey. And so in this uh, with, with Mike Filsame and I, at that time period, 2006, 2011, we were like the hub of internet marketing. So that's where, you know, we hosted the event that was a $5,000 per person event where Jeff Walker was there, Russell Brunson was there, Joel Tyrion was there, you know, on and on all these experts who are very well known uh, now were decently well known back then, but uh, no one saw the trajectory uh, of where they would be, right? So we became that hub and, and Mike and I and, and several others joined the syndicate and had this syndicate where we were behind some of the you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of launches that occurred from 2006 to 2011. So in doing so, there's a quote that says, if everything's under control, you're not going fast enough. And that's a quote from a famous race car driver, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people, when they see these experts, they're like, oh man, if I only had it figured out like so-and-so does or so-and-so. And I'm talking the biggest, best names in the world. I mean, when you peek behind the curtain, you see, they're, they're, it's not under control. <laughs> because they're human. They have, uh, they're doing the best that they can with what they've got, but they're far from perfect and they have problems. They have issues. They have challenges. So when you see behind the scenes, you're like, man, I thought it'd be a much more smooth operation than what it is. But that quote is true. If everything's under control, you're not going fast enough. So you have, you have this outer perspective, but when you see behind the screen, you see the humanity, you see they're doing the best they can. You see that they have problems, they have challenges, they're moving on the fly, they're making things happen at a fast pace. So I've taken all of that and I help people, I guess, find a Zen, <laughs> right? To recognize it's the law of sowing and reaping. 
right? Look, I grew up on a farm in, in North Carolina in between the marriages and divorces as a child. I was on a farm and 365 days a year, you got to feed, you got to take care of the animals, you got to take care of the fields. And this is the same thing in your business. And guess what? As long as you're continually doing the proper work, you aren't worried about the results. The results come, right? But it's knowing what that proper work is. And the 2080 principle, 20% of your activities are going to produce 80% of your results. That's just how it is, right? So there's a lot of moving parts to how to simplify it. And the number one thing is it's never perfect. Right? It doesn't, just like I, I thought the, the view would be better at the top of those sales organizations. And I get there and I'm like, oh man, life isn't what I thought it would be <laughs> when I reach. Same thing applies in business. When you reach the million, I thought a million, man, my life, that's just it. Like, you know, retire, you're good. Million doesn't last that long. Like, <laughs> like when it's all said and done, 10 million doesn't last that long. Right? So when you get this larger scale grasp, you just take life uh, more in the, this is what I explained to my children. My children now are 18 and 15, and now my fiance's children are 21 and 16. And I'm like, look, we go to amusement parks, and we're the first one there. We have the game plan. The game plan doesn't have multiple steps. It's like, where are we going first? What's the ride we're doing first? As soon as the door opens up, boom, we get there. We're first. We do it. And then we're like, at the end of it, okay, now where? Now where? And, and sometimes let's ride it again. Okay, great. Let's ride it again. Uh, oh, nope, we want to go on this ride. Okay, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. How do we get there? Right. And many times we'll versus us figuring out, we'll ask the person at the park, hey, we're looking for this ride. How do we get there quickest? OK, turn right, turn left. OK, boom. We walk fast with a purpose. We get there. Then when that's done, now what? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is life. This is the greatest amusement park in the universe. And here's the other thing about that analogy. And so no matter if you're there for one day, three days or a week, guess what? It goes like that. It goes like that. And so does life. So. While you're there and while you're here in this greatest amusement park in the universe, recognize where are you, where are you wanting to go, and walk there with a purpose. And, and guess what? This happens in amusement parks for us as well. We get to that ride and, oh, sorry, folks, the ride is now uh, under, you know, it's closed. We don't sit down and pout. But, oh, crap, okay, where are we going now? Right? It's a continually what's next, what's next, what's next. And when you can be present in the moment, there's many books about this, you know, be here now, uh, the power of now, uh, lots of uh, biblical references and other uh, religions have the power of being present. In essence, that's all it is about simplification. When you can be the farmer of your fields and be the adventurer in the greatest amusement park in the universe, which is your life, you're so fully present, you give your presence. So I've been to Fiji. I've had conversations with Tony Robbins at his resort in Fiji, in the Mali. And I will tell you this, you walk away feeling when, when you're done with that conversation, like I'm the only person in the world when Tony was talking to me, there's his mind is not distracted. He is there with you 100%. It's not that, you know, you and I all have that, that conversation where someone's like, mm -hmm, yep, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. yep, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or pe peering off to the side. No, not with Tony, 100% presence. Guess what else? Also, Brendan Burchard was in the syndicate, spent much time with Brendan. Guess what you find with Brendan? When you're talking with Brendan, there's no one else in the world. You're it. Presence. So simplification is being fully present in the moment, handling what's yours to handle. And, and the, my most favorite question that I help myself and my, my clients ask all the time is what am I doing right now the absolute best use of my time, energy, and effort? And I used to, when I was in workaholic mode, and I, I also help people get out of workaholic mode because I was there. And, you know, We were putting the 20-hour days in for a long time. I don't recommend it. It got us some great results, but you could get there without the 20 hour days. So um, I used to think in that workaholic mode, that question always had to be a work thing. So I would feel guilty if I'm with my kids. Oh, is this the best use of my time right now? Oh no, I should be doing some revenue producing activity. No, I should be present with my kids, right? So you become present and you, you have discernment just like the farmer discerns. Is it time to feed the animals or take care of them or if you take care of the fields? You know what's yours to do in that moment. And when you trust that discernment, you now get to a point where what's the absolute best use of my time right now? Is what I'm doing the best use of my time right now? Yes. Okay, continue doing it. No? Okay, what is the best use of my time? Well, right now it would be to shut this computer down and go spend time with my spouse. Go spend time with my kids, et cetera. Right? It's that whole thing. And what I help my clients, and, and, and I, from my own learning, because I already mentioned I've been that workaholic, 
uh, I helped them ask the question that I was asked years ago by someone who worked with Jim Rohn the same time Tony Robbins did and actually had a company with Tony uh, in the early 80s. And so when I was working in one project, those 20 hour days, my son was fairly new. This was in 2002. Um, and he was fairly uh, newborn. And uh, I was bragging on how hard I was working. And this person, he sat back, he's like, Tom, I can tell you're looking for me to pat you on the back, you know, because this society kind of rewards workaholism. He's like, but didn't you just have your son born not too long ago? I said, yeah. He's like, how's your son doing? I'm like, yeah, he's pretty good. How much have you seen your son? Like, oh, it was like a dagger through my heart. You know, not much. Like, yeah, that's what I figured because you're working so much. He's like, you want to impress me, get the same results in half the amount of time. Think about that. So as you listening to this, if you want to impress me, you want to impress Jeff, get the same results in half the amount of time. And the first time I heard that, uh, the immediate response was, well, that's impossible. I can't get the same results in half the amount of time. Well, guess what? Thinking like that, 100% accurate. Because that quote from Henry Ford, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So if I think it's impossible, guess what? It is impossible for me at that moment. Until I can bridge that gap and say, what if? What if that is possible? What would it look like? What would it take for me to get the same results in half the amount of my time? Well, guess what? That's what it's, that's what it's all about of now looking at delegation, looking at all the different ways to get the task done without you being the person doing it. And there's a whole different mind sh shift and, and a different mindset. And, and it becomes not only a reality, it becomes a fun challenge because you continually do this. How can I do it again? I already did it once. Now how I'm getting these same results in half the amount of my time. How can I do it again? But the key is when that vacuum is created, because now you're not that workaholic, where are you putting that time and energy now? Because I've also been down that Wolf of Wall Street path. That's not too fulfilling either. You all know the movie, right? Mm -hmm. I've lived like, so Mike and I joke about it like that. We kind of lived that life. We did. Because he was, he's up on Long Island, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mike, we, Mike and I were on Long Island. We were in Ron Concomo back So that's literally like where the movie took place too, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But we lived, we weren't in Wall Street or anything, but we lived that life. Like we had a crazy adventurous life, but uh, there came a point where I'm like, you know what? The hundred thousand hour nights in Vegas, you know, don't really sit well with me. Right. So it's like, I got kids. I'd rather invest that in, and do other things with it. So um, it, it, it's not fulfilling. You know, it may look fun in the movies uh, to go down that path, but in essence, it's all just because I wasn't born into wealth. So I was financially illiterate. And what do we have to show? Oh, oh well, wealthy people are supposed to do this. You're supposed to go do this and do this and, you know, do and go escape is really what it is. Escapism into drugs or alcohol or women or all that craziness. And it's not fulfilling. So when you, when you are achieving the results where you're getting the same results or better in half the amount of your time, then you can put that into the important areas, which are your health and your key relationships, right? Because guess what? I deal with a lot of clients who are very well known, who have huge bank accounts, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, all, you know, people just see them as the, you know, walking on water type of situations, but their health's in the crapper. Whether, and, and maybe the physical health is okay, but their mental or emotional health is not in balance and their key relationships are out of, out of line. That doesn't have to be it too. You can have it all. Yes, is it going to take dedication? Is it going to take commitment? Absolutely. But you can have that business growing at rapid exponential uh, rates as well as being in the absolute best shape of your life as well as have relationships that are absolutely fulfilling for you and the others. It's all possible. But if you think, just like I said earlier, my first reaction when that, that uh, challenge was posed to me, that's impossible. If you're sitting there thinking, nope, I can't grow my business and have health and relationships, sadly, you're right. Until you can ask yourself, is it possible? Are there people that are doing it? Could I be one of those people to have it all? And my thing is like, why not? Why wouldn't you? Like, you're not any better or worse than some of these people out there who may be respected, but their health and relationships are in the crapper, but now they've got it all. They've got the business growing at rapid rates. They've got their health at the healthiest level they've ever been, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And their, their personal and professional relationships are off the charts fulfilling for themselves and others. It is possible if you believe it is for you. So that's the first question. There we go. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I mean, that, that's so good, man. What a, what a fertile field for me to, you know, mm -hmm. So, and now of just your background and your history and your experience and your perspective. Um, and there was <laughs> so much I'd like, you know, when I'm listening, I'm always like, okay, what do I want to know more about? 
I have like nine questions now, so I got I to gotta pick. But I, I think it was really, um, first of all, I love that quote that if, uh, if everything is in control, you're not going fast enough. Right. I'm like, yep. yeah, that lands. That's, that's yep. about right. Because I get super antsy mm -hmm. if I feel like everything is too predictable. Yep. Uh, but I, I, I find that is actually the terror that mm -hmm. a lot of people have with pursuing having it all. Yep. Is that in order, it's, it's sort of an irony that in order to have it all, you have to tolerate a lack of, a certain amount of, a certain lack of control. Yep. And everybody's trying to have it all by controlling everything and making it just so, but actually you won't have it all unless you learn to be okay. Like you said, being present in the moment, focusing only on what you can control and making total peace with all the rest of it. Detaching from the outcome is really what that boils down to. When, when you're giving it your all as the farmer of your field, so let's say you got three fields, your health, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Like, and those are little separate fields within that health field. Right. Because we all have friends that are rock solid in the mirror, but mentally and emotionally not so rock solid, right? So the, the key is to have it all. So you got the field of your health, you got the field of your relationships, your personal, your professional, your social relationships, you need to know who your people are. And relationships, it's one word, love equals time. Are you giving and contributing time to those key relationships? If you're not, you're not showing love, right? And then for the monetary thing, I break it down into today money, tomorrow money, and contribution. So you've got the fields, your health, your relationships, and your finances. And as long as you're the farmer who's doing the work and putting in the proper time, energy, resources, and effort for each of those fields, they're going to produce the crops, right? So there's a big... Um, congruence there's it's very congruent hand in glove type of situation when you're you're good at discerning what's yours to do remember that question is what i'm doing right now the absolute right. best use of my time um and when you're good at that you detach from all the outcomes and that's where the peace comes because the outcomes just happen you do the work for your physical health is the easiest one you know you eat properly slash right. healthy, you know reasonable uh, uh, sizes, portion sizes, healthy foods, um, in, in ingesting, you know, good liquids and stuff like that and getting proper sleep and moving, right. Moving properly. That's it. You know, and there's, there's billion dollar companies out there that, you know, look, eat properly slash healthy, get proper rest, which is key, move properly. That's it. You do those things. And guess what? In short order, holy crap, I'm losing weight. I'm feeling good. I'm in better shape. Well, of course, it's right. not that hard. It's not rocket science. You're putting the proper energy and effort into place there. Same thing happens in business. When you know what your key K KPIs, key performance indicators are, you know what the 20% activities are that give you the biggest oomph, the biggest results, and you're putting the proper time, energy, and effort in. We've all seen probably, well, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It's really good the pickle jar where you have the big rocks, the smaller yeah. rocks, the, the, the tiny rocks, the sand and the water. A lot of people, guess what? It's real. The reason that thing is so powerful is because people see it. They're like, yeah, that's me. I'm putting in the water first, then the sand, then the small rocks. And then when it gets to the end, I can't fit the big rocks in. Duh. Like when you do the big rocks and this is the biggest, best thing. It's like, holy cow, Tom, I, I'm actually, you know, doing these things and I'm becoming healthier. I'm losing weight and, you know, and I'm actually doing these things in my business. And it's working like, yeah, no joke. Like the big rocks are big rocks for a reason. They work. They're the 20% activities that give you the 80% results. And what happens is people get in the busy work in their business. And, you know, that's the water and the sand activities, which are meaning like 80% of, of activities that only give 20% or less of the, of the results, right? So it's just prioritization uh, of what's important to you. Like, and do you, like, what do you want? Do you want to be healthy? Do you want amazing relationships? Do you want your business to grow, to give you the freedom that would allow you to do what you want, when you want, where you want, with whom you want, is my definition of it, you know? And when you have that, that opens up a huge amount of possibilities. Um, so anyhow, there's, there's that aspect. So, so on that point, you mentioned the key to the peace is totally detaching from the outcome. And what does that mean? So in relationships, you aren't ever concerned about your, your significant other leaving because that's ridiculous. Why would you put time in? You're only focused on, and this is from the greatest secret uh, in the world from Earl Nightingale, we become what we think about. Think about optimal health. Think about optimal relationships. Think about optimal growth. And your thoughts will be in conjunction with your actions 
and you totally detach from the outcomes because you're going to be healthy. You're going to have amazing relationships and you're going to have growth in your financial situation because you're giving the proper time and attention to it. You don't ever have to worry about your health being just automatically gone out of the blue and or your relationship automatically gone or your finances automatically gone. And guess what? If you do walk in one day and, and this has happened, uh, not, not happily, but I, you know, even with Mike and I, we had a business we put time, energy, effort into million dollar plus business. We woke up one day when the, the credit card slap occurred like in 2008, 2009. Wait, where's all, we should have money in the process now. What happened? Oh, the credit card company stopped processing the rebills. And this happened to, to, to Russell Brunson and many others. You put all this time and energy in and the daggum industry changes. <laughs> so, so you built this residual income and all of a sudden it's gone. You're like, well, crap. And like, just like we talked about with the rides down at the amusement park, sure, you cry a little bit and you, and you pout a little bit. You're like, well, crap. Well, we're, we're not going to sit in the corner forever. Stand up, dust yourself off and say, what's next? Oh, well didn't see that coming. What's next? And we're able to do it once. We're able to do it again. Right? So life's going to happen. Challenges are going to occur. But the key, and this is a tough one. It was a tough one for me to learn. Total detachment from the outcome. Total detachment. I'm doing the work. I'm not worried about the results at all. The results will come. Now, when you're tending to the field, the law of sowing and reaping is you can't go and till the soil, plant the seeds, cover it up, fertilize it, water it, and go there every day. We're, why aren't you growing? Why aren't you growing? Right? You, you trust that it has a, a process. You, you know, it's not going to immediately happen. It's not a, a chia pet that you're growing. You're growing stuff that's, that's got foundation to it. So it has that gestation period and you just do the work and you know, the results are going to be there as you sow, so shall you reap. So detach from the outcome and just trust the process. Yeah. You know, the, the Buddhists, have a, a, a talk or a, an idea about being a, you know, an impartial observer in your own life. And I think about that a lot. And I, I love the, I talk about law of the farm a lot. I love that you're, you're talking about that. Um, the rocks, I made some big changes in my life a couple of years ago around the whole rock concept. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been amazing. But the, I, I think the, the crux here is trusting the process. Yes. And you know, I, I'm always looking for like, what can people that listen to this podcast, like they may not remember you, they may not remember me, but I want them to remember something from this conversation that two years from now, 10 years from now is still impacting them. And you know, what, what I'm feeling is this concept of trusting the process. You know, you mentioned health. Nobody's going to argue with you that if they eat clean work out, get enough rest, hydrate, burn more than they consume. Like nobody's going to argue with you that that process works, right? right, right. Uh, they, might, they might have some weird rationalizations in their mind about why it won't work for them or they're emotionally handicapped and they can't do it. But like nobody disagrees that it works. Farming, generally, I don't think anybody's going to argue that like if you do that process you described, eventually a sprout will appear, um, you know, all things being equal environmentally. But when it comes to actually optimizing our own life in terms of the balance and particularly in terms of making money, which is where a lot of people's focus goes, the only process that most people have ever really been assured about is the process of getting a degree and getting a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even a high producer, elite performer like yourself, who's, who's been excellent at multiple disciplines that are very hard. I mean, wrestling, I did one semester of wrestling in like middle school and I don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life. Like that's a hard thing to excel at. Um, and yet still you struggled as an entrepreneur. Um, because in a way it's like, we're never told what the process is. Right. So, and, and also, I love this about your, and, and for, actually, let me finish that point by saying, fear not, if you're a listener or a watcher of this show, there is a process, mm -hmm. and, and we'll get into that. Um, but, uh, but the other thing that, oh, I lost my train of thought. There was another great thing that occurred to me, and it'll come back to me. But, um, but speaking of the process, I, uh, I would like to talk about that, like, what is, what would you say, what's the gap? What is it that you're saying, you know, do the work, have a plan, execute daily, stay in the present, and you'll eventually get the result. 
Can you distill, I mean, you work with a lot of elite people, like people that have done really well. You're known as the mentor to the mentors. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's by design that maybe not everybody's heard of you because you're not trying to serve everybody. Right. You're trying to serve, like, I would assume, like if a guy like me wakes up one day and goes, oh my gosh, my, my pay, you know, I, my, my, my income was 2 million and my payroll's 2.6 and I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. And I get, somehow this got out of hand and I want to lose my house. It's like big problems, big swings kind of issues that I'm, you're the guy I'm going to call. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so to that guy, to the, everyone else, to anybody who maybe never even started a business in their life, what would you say is the process that they can trust? Because I don't, I don't know that most people actually know sure. where to start. Well, and that, that was my first course. So back in 2001, um, uh, so the funny story was um, I moved from Rochester, New York. I was the, uh, uh, the large account manager for a copier company. And out of the blue, I get this call saying, hey, I heard you're good at copier sales. How would you like to be the publisher of the North Carolina Home Book? And I asked the obvious question, what does selling copiers have to do with being a publisher of a book? And they're like, well, if you can sell copiers, you can do this, right? So in essence, the publisher was a salesperson to sell this North Carolina home book to the high-end architects, builders, landscape architects, interior designers for the million dollar plus homes. So this was a 500 page resource that had it broken down by tabs for people in the Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, or Greensboro area looking to build or remodel their million dollar plus home. So I quit my cushy job for the adventure, which I had just bought my first duplex in, in 2001. And I had just unpacked. I was, renting the, I, I was renting the lower and living in the upper. I'm like, all right, I bought my Carlton Sheets program, baby. I had this yeah, thing yeah. going. I was going to become this real estate mogul. By the time I'd unpacked, I accepted this job, quit my cushy job. I could have made six figures, kicking my feet up on the table for this new adventure with this billion dollar company. And I go down to Charlotte, North Carolina in July of 01, and I had four months to get the book done. Two months into it, September 11th happens, right? Mm -hmm. So September 11th. And I remember being in Charlotte, North Carolina on the way to meet with the interior designer for the elite of NASCAR. Like he does, he did Jeff Gordon's house and a whole bunch of other NASCAR uh, people. So I was going to his office. When I hear about this happening in New York City, the plane hit the World Trade Center. I'm like, what? I'm like, I lived in New York City for a while with my stepfather in that first story. I'm like, I don't remember even seeing a plane. Like, that's so weird. Like, I, I didn't even know they were like, so it just sounded odd. Mm -hmm. And as I continued driving, a second plane hit. I'm like, I pulled over and I'm, I called my office. And this was early in the morning. We, we were there eight in the morning at the office. I called us, look, we're under attack. You need to go home, send everybody home. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, turn on the radio, turn on the TV the United States is under attack. And then the, the thing happened with one in Pennsylvania and then the one in, in the, the Pentagon, et cetera. Yeah. And so I get to the interior designer's office and we're just watching TV, like what the heck is going on? So on the side of that road is when it hit me, like Tom, it's time for you to turn from being the student to become a teacher. And so I had been the, the consummate student. Like I, I'd studied Tony Robbins and Jim Rohn and, and Zig Ziglar and you know, the whole list of Nightingale Conant products at the time. We didn't have Audible and all this YouTube right, and right. things like that. We had Nightingale Conant and I owned all of the Nightingale Conant stuff. Joe Vitale, Jay Abraham. I've been, I'm great friends with Joe and Jay and I met and worked with all these people that were my heroes back at that moment. But I was like, all right, it's time for me to answer the question that people have been asking. Me. And the question was, Tom, how do you do it? And that's like, you know, what's the system? And it, prior to 9-11, I was, I would just you know, uh, you know, I must be lucky, right place, right time, whatever. No, it was dedication. It was commitment. It was determination. It was, it was being that consummate person and saying, I'm going to do this, you know, come hell or high water, I'm getting there. Right. And, and just that, that initial determination. So that evening, you know, I studied Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone, et cetera. So that evening I said, you know what, what is my system? What is my system? How did I become the national bicycle champion? The number one honor man out of the United States Marine Corps boot camp, number one in five sales organizations, et cetera. How did I do it? What's my system? And at first my mind replied with, you know, it's, it was different for each of them. Like what you did in the Marine Corps is different than what you right. did in bicycle riding. So then I asked a better question. So the key to you watching this is when your mind gives you that stuff that isn't the answer you're looking for, well, I need to ask a better question. So I said, okay, if I had to narrow it to five things, that I did in the bicycle riding, that I did in, in uh, wrestling, that I did in boot camp, that I did in the sales organizations. 
What were the five common elements that I did in each of them to be knowing nothing to becoming the best in many times record time, rec- you know, shorter than anyone has ever done it. Mm-hmm. And so that evening, I woke up in the middle of the night and grabbed a piece of paper and started writing. I came up with the five things that I did in each of those areas. And I called it at the time, my success magnet system. So these are, this is the five-step success magnet system process. So what is the process that if you study yourself, you know, if you study Jeff, if you study any of the top people you look up to, you'll see that they apply these five steps, whether they knew it or not. And so I, I broke it down into the five steps and they're this. Step number one is vision. You have to have a clear vision of like, man, I, w- I want to do that, right? So the bike riding, I already told you, I saw a rad. I'm like, I want to do some tricks on bikes. That looks cool. When I saw Zig Ziglar speak, I was like, man, I want to do that. Like that guy touched my heart. I said, imagine one day me being able to, to share wisdom and insights that would touch people's hearts and change their lives the way that Zig changed mine. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, I didn't know how, but I, I had that vision, right? So it starts with that vision. And, and when I got to those sales organizations, my vision was who's number one? because I'm going to be number one soon, right? That was my vision, all right? So you have to have the vision. And that vision, you know, if you study a lot of Napoleon Hill books and other, other top experts, it's that burning desire, that vision that just drives you. When I, when I got into the, the, the bicycle trick riding, I was like, I just loved it. I didn't have the vision of being the national champion. I was like, I want to be the best I'm possible, I can possibly be. And I ended up becoming a national champion. Um, so vision, you got to have that vision and it's got to be something that you just like when I, when I rode the bikes, I'd wake up early, ride all day and that's it. Like you'd forget to eat because you're doing it. Like, and that's what happens in all the things I've excelled in. You're just so passionate about it. You'll do it and you have to be reminded, Hey, are you going to eat today? Oh crap. I forgot. <laughs> right? Right. That's the type of drive that you want with that vision. Step number two is belief, belief on numerous levels. You have to have belief in yourself. You have to have belief in your company, belief in your product, belief in your service, whether that's your own or whether that's someone else that you're representing. That was how I became number one in five sales organizations. I believed in the company, the product, the service, and I believed in myself to the point where I knew they can't get with any competitors what they get by having me as the sales rep for uh, that particular company, product, and service. And you also have to have belief in the law of sowing and reaping that we've talked about. You have to have belief in, uh, you know, uh, the fact that if others can do it, so can you, right? Trust me, nobody's walking on water. They're human. They, you know, they had a vision. They believed in themselves. And if they did it, you can do it too. Now, there is that, at, you know, you can't be Shaquille O'Neal or, or LeBron James or Michael Jordan if you don't have certain talents, but you get what I'm saying. If, if for most things, we have a self-regulator, kind of like cars have regulators. Generally, the quote from Napoleon Hill is whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Many times that regulator won't let us conceive the idea if we don't have the capability to believe it right. possible. Right. So, so we kind of have an internal regulator. I'm not like, Oh, I'm going to be the next Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, that's just, come on. I'm five foot 11, you know, tiny, <laughs> not going right, to happen. Right. right. So we have this internal regulator, but when you feel like that's mine to do, you have to believe in the fact that if others can do it, you can do it too. So step number one, vision. Step number two, belief. Step number three is identify and align. And this is where you find the mentors. This is where you identify people who have achieved what you're seeking to achieve and you align yourself with them. Back in the day, I was listening to Nightingale Conan. Back in the day, I didn't have the money to go buy a lot of the tapes. I went to the library and would take the tapes home and duplicate them. Remember you had the double cassette tape? I duplicate them and had my own library of duplicated tapes from Nightingale Conan. Uh, and I listened to them in automobile university back in the day in the car driving around as a sales rep. Now we have the iPhones and the Androids and audible and all this and YouTube, all these resources are there for you. Literally waiting instead of going to memorize songs that you sing along to go memorize wisdom from Napoleon Hill and Joe Vitale and, and Jeff and myself and things like that. Um, uh, so third, identify and align. It's never been easier, but as Jim Rohn says, Things that are easy to do are easier not to do. So it's easy to go to YouTube and search for some Jim Rohn or some Tony Robbins or some you know, Tom Beale or some Jeff Lerner, you know, but it's easier to, to not do it, right? So, so identify and align. Now, the key is to work one-on-one. Like the best success I had with mentors was working with those mentors and having that personal guidance. But then you can get group coaching, you can get uh, courses from them, et cetera. And then if the worst, you know, which is still great, is go search on YouTube. Nowadays, there's free trainings that pretty much can teach you anything you want to know. 
So identify and align is a third step. Fourth step is commitment to action. You got to be willing to roll your sleeves up and do the work. I think we all recognize you're not going to get healthy sitting on the couch eating a half a gallon of ice cream, right? It's not how it works. You got to be willing to do the work. So commitment to action. Uh, and then when you get good guidance from your third step, identify and align, you're going to get the mentors pointing you in the right direction. So now you're clear on what the proper action is, because it's not commitment to busy work. It's commitment to the proper actions and commitment to the, to knowing that this statement is true. Imperfect action always beats perfect inaction. Think about that. Imperfect action always beats perfect inaction. So perfection is not the key here. It's how can you fail forward fast, right? So commitment to action is step number four. And step number five, I call the secret step. Step. In each of the things I did, I had fun. You got to have fun. If you aren't having fun on the journey, man, come on. This is the greatest amusement park in the world. Are you having fun with the amusement park? Hopefully you are. Well, you can have fun on this journey to health, on this journey to amazing relationships, on this journey to multi-million dollar results. You can have fun. Don't be climbing the mountain, scraping your knee and scraping your elbows and falling and I'll be happy when I get to the top. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be happy when you get to the top. Enjoy the journey is the key. So those five steps, vision, belief, identify and align, commitment to action and have fun will get you from where you are to where you want to be quickly, efficiently, effectively, and have fun in the process. Yeah, if you, if you saw or heard me typing, it's because I was taking notes of those, those five steps. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I interviewed uh, Evan Carmichael last week, who's a big YouTuber and sort of distiller of success wisdom on, on the internet. And um, he, he is on a mission to solve the world's biggest problem, in his words, which is people don't believe in themselves. Mm. And it, it was a powerful conversation. And I, it, what's interesting about it to me is, so you look at someone like you, like you, f you quote failed as an entrepreneur mm. before you succeeded. Um, yep. You know, the word failure is kind of a, a perspective question, but you didn't fail to believe that you could succeed. Mm -hmm. Even when you failed to succeed, you didn't go, oh, well, I, I can't do this. Right. And I got to think, you know, some of that is because you had an experience, as you put it, you're used to winning. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. had experience with winning. Mm -hmm. Now, and I thought it was really interesting what you said about how we have a kind of an internal regulator that's like, we're not going to pin our major aspirations to things that are actually unconceivable for us. Right. That's, I thought that was a really brilliant point because I get people say that all the time. They're like, oh, well, you know, if I just believe, if believing is all it takes, then what are you saying? I could just believe, in fact, basketball comes up a lot. They're like, oh, so I could dunk from the free throw line or something. Like, no, <laughs> but realistically, you're not going to even entertain that as a belief. Right. Um, but for you, you know, you were able to believe because you had wins under your belt. And well, and I actually, I think that's overly reductive. You were able to believe, period. Mm -hmm. Because of that, you already had wins under your belt that supported your ability to believe and reinforced it. Um, my experience of helping a lot of people enter the realm of entrepreneurship is that a lot of people are just gripped, like saturated with self-doubt. 100%. 100%. And it's, it's honestly, it's like, you know, because I even get top performers, by the way, even we all are oh, yeah. limited. We all are exactly where we are based upon we feel that's what we deserve. Think about that. No matter if they're at 100 million, a billion, we have the temperature gauge in our mind of this is what we're worth. And when the, when a surprise bill comes up and our, our resources drop significantly, guess what happens? We get back to our comfort zone. Yeah. If we get a big excess, guess what happens? We get rid of it quickly to get back in our comfort zone. We all have a self-regulator. So wherever you are right now watching this, you're exactly where you are because that's what you believe you're worth. That's a hard one to grasp. Trust me, when I heard that, I was like, F you, you know, here's the middle finger to you. That's not true. You know, no, it is true. And it's a, it's a harsh reality, similar to the harsh reality of you're going to be the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, they're great people. Well, they're great people, but they're going to be the average health, 
relationships and finances. And I looked around like I'm screwed. Like <laughs> it was a point. I'm like I'm yeah, screwed. Yeah. That, so you get you get better friends. It's not like you don't you disassociate. You know you know, but you learn how to surround yourself. But same thing. We are 100 percent living the life that we feel comfortable with. Now I spoke on stage in a Borat Mankini. The topic was uh, the power of stepping out of your comfort zone. And guess what? You're going to have, you don't have to step on stage in a Borat Mankini to do it, but you have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to expand continually your comfort zone because it doesn't matter if you're just starting out or you reach multiple millions or multiple tens of millions, we all have that comfort zone. And until you're able to step outside of that and, and the way that you're able to expand that is to find people who have results that if they had your results, they'd be like, Oh crap, what the heck happened to me? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, like, Oh crap. I screwed up big time. Like, and this is like, and when you have great results, you know, you find people like, well, if that was what my life, uh, yeah, where's the closest bridge. Right. So uh, <laughs> you find people that uh, have that exponentially large results that then come in and, and you see how they think differently. Cause it's not about working harder. You can't have certain results and oh, I'm just going to work harder to get, a 10 X type of result. It's, it's a whole different mindset that allows you to grow exponentially, but you're 100% right. Everyone on this planet, every human, um, it's, it's literally a lack of belief in ourselves. Now I have a quick story. We might be able to slide it in. So yeah, I was absolutely. in high school wrestling. I, I, as a senior, I was tiny. I, I wrestled 119 pounds in my senior year. Wow. I was going to crush the kid at my weight class for this particular dual meet. So I went up to 126 pounds to wrestle this tougher kid. Doesn't sound like much, but in wrestling, that's a lot of, of additional muscle. So I get up there and he kind of threw me around a little bit, but I got my bearing and I, I, I beat the crap out of him. And afterwards, when I changed, I was walking back to my dad and a coach from another town was talking to my dad. They didn't know I even heard it, but the coach told my dad, he said, your son's going to win states this year. What they didn't hear was my inner voice, which said, no, I'm not. I can't beat Gary Dakar. Oh, think about this. This goes right into the point that you said. In our minds, we limit ourselves. They believed in me more than I believed in myself. And, and guess what? Fast forward a few months, it's semifinals and sectionals. I'm wrestling Gary Dakar. It's 0-0 zero, zero with seconds left in the match. And my mind was like, wait a second. I thought I was supposed to be losing. And in that thinking, I, he won. The yeah. question is, did I lose it and let him win? And, I, and looking back, I should have crushed him, but I didn't believe in myself. Fast forward to when I'm in the Marine Corps. I'm in Cherry Point, North Carolina. And there's a wrestling club. I joined the wrestling club and man, there's some tough kids and I'm wrestling these, these guys and I'm beating them. And I'm like, damn, they're like, they came to me like, how many times did you win States? I just said zero. I didn't win States at all. They're like what? And I'm beating them. So I'm like, why did you win States? I won States three times. Like what? Like, so in my mind, had I known they were state champions before we were wrestling, I probably wouldn't have allowed myself to win. And that was the big epiphany for me. I said, holy cow. And that, and that brought me back to that memory of, of that coach telling my dad, your son's going to win states and that whole thing. I was like, whoa, I didn't know these were state champions and I beat them. Who, you know, so, so now I switched my, I was, I was the same wrestler, no different abilities, just a different belief. And I was like, you know what? I beat state champs. Like I eat breakfast. Like that's, that's just what I do. I beat state champions. And that's a whole, so the same person, same skill sets, yeah. different belief. I beat people on paper I had no business beating, and I took that into business. And so that's, that's a great story. I love that you brought that up because each of us, myself, you, everyone watching this, have an internal limiter, an internal regulator in that story about the, me not believing in that, that I, I probably could have won states had I believed in it. So my gift now and what I do to these top performers is I help them see the bigger version of themselves, which many times they reject it's outside their comfort zone to see, well, they're only doing a couple of million. No, I see you doing tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Like with what you have, that's not only possible, it's just inevitable, but it's not going to happen until they stretch their belief, similar to me beating the state champions. Uh, and that's, that sounds simpler than it is, but we grow into the beliefs that uh, if we can, if we can stretch out that comfort zone, we have to continually do that to reach the next uh, level of success and results. You know, I, uh, I resonate so strongly with what you're saying. I will, I, I generally try not to share my stories on these interviews, mm -hmm. but I'm going to break my own rule because I think it's just so germane and so 
it's, it's where I'm resonating with exactly what you're saying. So I grew up with pretty successful parents mm -hmm. financially. They were married, you know, they're still married to this day. I mean, they, you know, one marriage each to each other, mm -hmm. uh, health con like, you know, it was like anybody looking at my childhood, my family would be like, these guys have it made. Right. Mm -hmm. And so since I started becoming more successful online, um, I had this cycle that lasted about 10 years mm -hmm. where I would get to a certain point and there was always some circumstance or some reason why I would pull back or I'd get derailed or I'd, you know, and finally about two years ago when I was ready for like the next thing, whatever my next thing was, I sold my agency mm -hmm. and I was going to do my next thing. I hired a coach uh, who basically sounds like he had a similar conversation to the conversations you have with your, your clients, which is like, Jeff, look, you've hit levels that most people think, oh, that's all you could possibly want. Like that's, you should be grateful. You should be happy. You should, frankly, you should probably retire. Mm -hmm. And he helped me realize that I still had work undone. And then in fact, I had a whole transcendent uh, possibility for my life, but I was going to have to go where I'd never been before. Talk about expanding your comfort zone. And the way my company now, Entra, started was in September 2018, I started doing what, I've, what has always been terrifying to me, which is putting out social high visibility content onto the internet. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up with a lot of insecurity. I was bullied. I always felt ugly. I always felt um, like someone that didn't really want to be seen. I was happy making money as long as I wasn't out front. Mm -hmm. And man, it was hard. It was like, I got to do it. I got to do it. And I have been putting out a huge amount of content for the last two years. I mean, I have over 500 videos on my YouTube channel. I have probably a thousand on my Facebook page. I have, you know, 800 posts on Instagram and it's all just me. It's, I, I, this is my, I, I started this podcast four months ago and this is already like the 90th episode. Like I've completely gone to the other side as far as content creation and putting myself out there and exposing myself to haters and exposing myself to criticism. And you know what? I am on track to be 10 times more successful than I was. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's been, every step of it has been terrifying and mm -hmm. thrilling because it's all been, even I had a comfort zone because of how I grew up that was already far beyond a lot of people's comfort zone. So a lot of people I think thought that I was an outlier success, but mm -hmm. actually all I was doing was achieving to the level of, really my parents and my life and my expectation. This is the first time I'm 41 years old that I'm going way past it. And it, and what I, the reason I'm sharing this, and I know that you've had, you have stories of people that have made a hundred million dollars. They call you up. Hey, Tom, I'm, I'm struggling. I don't know if I can keep it together. I mean, you, you mentioned to me, you've, you've literally talked people off the suicide ledge, so to speak. And like, it doesn't really matter where you are. Everybody has, a governor. Everybody has a thermostat setting. And to me, the greatest skill in life, and maybe you can talk more about how you help people do this, is to cast off the glass ceiling that you've been holding up over your own head. Yep. 100%. And, and I had a coach two years ago that helped me do it, but it was grueling, man. It was like, it was like therapy. And, you know, I was like sitting on Sigmund Freud's couch. What's your, how do you do it, man? How do you help people get past that? And I'm asking selfishly because if I could help everybody get past that, I'd have a hundred percent success stories in my business. <laughs> sure. Um, so the answer is people come to me mostly for business growth and they're already highly successful and they're like, okay, how can I go from 10 million to a hundred million the type of deal? And when we begin talking, they realize it's more of an internal adjustment. And it is an internal regulation of bringing their temperature of what they feel is their limit, their glass ceiling, and raising that, shattering, like shattering it. And, and similar to, to my uh, description of beating these state champions and, and just like the epiphany, like, holy crap, I am capable of that, right? And it's now it's just, it's not a matter. It's, it's like, so, so it's, a, it's a discussion that helps my belief in them be so strong that they believe in themselves. There's a great documentary that, that shows this in a way that is absolutely profound, and it's called Tyson. And it shows Custom Motto yeah. believing in Mike Tyson, who's this thug 
who was you know, going to either go to jail or stay at Cuss's house. And in the documentary, uh, Tyson's like, I was ready to rob this white person and head back to, to New York City. But Cuss was like, you're a champion. You're a champion. He's like, yeah, this crazy white guy keeps calling me a champion. What's up with that? He's like, one day, it's like, maybe I could be a champion. Maybe. And so he, he amped up his work at, effort and he, he, he did the work. And then uh, Cuss's belief in Mike along and it doesn't just it's not just belief like you talked about oh well, i can believe i can dunk no right. it was mike's dedication and commitment to become that champion and do the work along with the skill sets and the you know the physique and, and, and all that but cuss's belief transferred into mike and it shows how that brought mike all the way to the top but then cuss passed away and without that person, you know, then a whole bunch of hanger-ons and a whole right. bunch of viruses got in there and it brought him from the pinnacle uh, over a quarter billion dollars to losing it all and losing his freedom, being up, locked up in prison. Uh, you know, so there's nothing more profound than watching that documentary as an entrepreneur to see the power of belief take you all the way to the top. And then when you, when you become cocky and you, and you don't do the work, you don't tend to the fields, the crop's not going to be there. The weeds take over. And that's what happened with the, the, the second part of that movie. So I'm the custom auto. And I don't work, you know, it, the people who, who uh, are, are at those levels know who I am. But like, I'm not known by the masses. But I'm the goat, like, my, my, my fiance is always like, you know, amazed. Like, we'll be out at dinner. I got to take this. I don't have to. I'm going to only take this call real quick. And it's someone who's very well known, very well respected. And tell me he's in the field with a gun. Like, what? Like, what's going on? Like, what the heck's going on here? Like, and so basically just to be fully present. I'm not trained in that type of stuff. I don't even know why they feel they want to call me, but I get those calls. And, and that's in the crisis scenarios. But I, I also work with people who aren't at that ledge, <laughs> you know, ledge uh, situation, but are at a point where they realize the glass ceiling's there. Now what? What do I, you know, I just, no matter what I do, I keep hitting that glass ceiling. And so it really is um, the internal work. When you recognize that the journey to exponential growth is an emotional journey, mm. that's the change. It changes everything. It's not, it's not at that point, I was the same person with the same skills as that wrestler, but I now started beating the crap out of people that on paper, I had no business beating the crap out of. Why? Because I grew emotionally. I wasn't doing any new uh, moves or anything like that. I just emotionally transcended. And that's the same thing that happens in business. You're reaching certain levels and you'll never break through that glass ceiling, glass ceiling until you transcend and recognize it's an emotional journey. And then you just told, you become that fully present person who knows what the best use of your time is, who is committed to achieving the same results in half the amount of time and is willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes while also giving the proper time and energy to your health and to your key relationships because you can have it all. And it's literally that same thing. It's like, well, I can only, ha I got to choose either my business or my health or my relationships. One of the three. No, you can have it all with that decision. It's the same emotional epiphany that pushes people over and the same emotional epiphany that pushes them from the 2 million to 20 million, from 20 million to a hundred plus. It's an emotional shift. And I, I work with a billion dollar client. They think at a whole different level. They yeah. have like, it's, it's, it's literally, it's less strategy, less effort, less tactical stuff. And I, I, well, I, I, should, I guess I should have worded it, less, less tactical stuff and more strategic stuff, mm -hmm. right? So they're not about, we need to do more of this and more of this. It's like, okay, look, here's the goal. How are we going to get there, right? And the goal is like, most people would have a goal, like realistic goal here. Their goal is like, <laughs> it shatters reality. Right. Well, this is our goal. Like, well, that's impossible. Well, it is if you think it is. How can we make it a reality? Right. And it's, it's literally, you know, the same thing of me saying, I'm going to go beat that undefeated person. Like I beat people that a, a father came out of the stands wanting to fight me because he'd never, his son hadn't lost in years. Like, I'm like, like I just beat your son. I don't want to have to beat you too. Right. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's same thing in business. It's an emotional transcendence that leads to the better results and the, you believing that you can have it all. So it's, it's yeah, yeah. And you know, that belief thing is so hard because as you mentioned, you know, you like Tyson, mm -hmm. custom auto believed in him and belief is contagious, mm -hmm. but bad belief is contagious too. And so mm -hmm. here's the thing. You can't go out 
and force someone to believe in you. You can't necessarily go out and find someone who believes in you. But what you can do is separate and create space from anyone that doesn't. Right. That's in everyone's control. And, and usually when I have these conversations, you know, I have it in my mastermind sometimes. Uh, I'll, ha- I'll talk to the advisor about what they're bumping up against with our, with our students. And man, to a man, every single person that struggles with belief has someone else in their life who's struggling with belief. Right. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's valued relationships. It's a spouse, it's yeah. a sister, it's a parent. And it's very hard to say you need to create separation. Yep. But it, it's, it's like you said, thinking strat- strategically, not tactically. If right. you know that vision is paramount, then you have to have alignment in your life with your vision. You know that belief is paramount and that bad belief is contagious. You have to have separation from belief. You know that you need to identify and align with mentors and models that you can learn from. There's only so much time and social bandwidth in the day. If you've got people in your life that you're not learning from and modeling, they're taking the space of the people that you would. Usually it's, it's very hard personal choices right that right. give people hard the in the control, beginning but they become natural they just become natural you become the farmer who is good at discerning what's the best use of my time right yeah. now and you you don't have time for time wasters and or things that used to give you joy that now are just like disgusting like it's an emotional mature maturation like like that whole phase where we were just you know doing all that craziness that's like disgusting to me now at this yeah. phase it was a phase that had it, it was what it was and, and worked perfectly but now I don't have any desire for that type of stuff, right? It's an emotional maturation process. And you now are, are in more control of the great equalizer, which is time. All of us have 24 hours in a day and it's up to how you choose to invest it or waste it. And so you watching this, I commend you. You're exactly where I was back in the late 90s and early 2000s, listening to teleseminars. Like, I'm gonna figure this out some way, somehow. I'm gonna find the right person who can help me connect the dots to get me to realize the dreams that I had. I knew the corporate world wasn't my end all be all. I just knew even when I had success in the corporate world as a copier salesperson, I'm like, really, is that gonna be, like, I'm just gonna sell copiers? Like, like you know, I watched Dunder Mifflin, The Office. Yeah. That was, it was copier sales, but it was, it's, that was pretty much my life. I was in that world, I'm like, really? I'm just gonna be a copier salesman? That's, that's like my, my gift to the world. I'm like, I, I have bigger things that I, I have envisioned that I feel I'm capable of. And I saw it as a temporary situation. So when you're watching this, like just know, I mentioned today money, tomorrow money, a contribution. So many times I had the big dreams and I knew this is a temporary situation that's gonna fund my ideas, my bigger vision. And, and that's the money that funded my entrepreneurial uh, journey, right? So it's okay to have that today money. Yeah. I mean, I, I just shared it earlier. I, I ran into somebody and, uh, I was a president of a company with Jim Kelly, Hall of Fame quarterback from the Buffalo Bills. Mm-hmm. And we were getting this corporation off the ground. I needed to put bread on the table. So I was working with another friend who owned a, a, a home a security system. I'm knocking on doors, selling home security system while I'm the president of this company with Jim Kelly, which, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So regardless of where you are on your journey, recognize, and Mike same and many others had had jobs while they were figuring out how to get uh, the business up and running. So yeah. just do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Uh, following the proper guidance, you will get there. Yeah, you know, a lot of people say they hate their job. And I, I often ask people, do you hate your job or do you hate your future? Mm-hmm. Right. And they say, well, I'm like, I mean, right now, you're talking about sitting at a desk doing work at your job. If you start an internet business, you're going to be sitting at your desk doing work on that. Like, what's fundamentally different? The future is what changes in that scenario. So mm-hmm. it's fine to do the job, change, but be working on changing your future. Yep. Um, and it makes the present a lot more tolerable so mm-hmm. that you can be present in the present because you're not, you're not constantly looking for the, you know, the bigger, better deal. Um, yep. Well, Tom, this has been an awesome conversation, man. I, we, we align on so much. I, literally, I think we could like 
talk all day. Like go on a cruise and just talk yeah. for three days. But well, I'm, uh, a, I'm a co-founder with Mike on the marketers cruise. We've been oh, yeah. for 14 years. So yeah, we have 400 people that join us every year. Well, except this year, uh, upcoming right. because of this craziness that we're all in. But yeah, so you know, I've never done the marketers cruise. For for those who don't know, the marketers cruise is a an event where a lot of the best marketers in the world literally go hang out on a boat for what is it a week long? Yeah, seven seven to eight days. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. We did our fourteenth annual uh, last January. So uh, I'm a co original co-founder. Been on thirteen of the fourteen. I missed one one year. I'm, I might have to uh, I might have to break my dry spell and and join you on the, once the world opens up again. <laughs> right. um, Anyway, Tom, this has been amazing. Uh, I, how can people, I mean, you have so much to offer. It's, it's just pouring through the, the wires right now. How can people go get more, man? Where can they go follow? Even though you're not a mass market brand, still you have mass market wisdom. Where can they go get it? Well, I am committed to helping people get from where they are to where they want to be. So I have an app on iOS and Android you can get for free, but it's a membership app. You can register for free at thesimplifier.com. So my mm -hmm. nickname is The Simplifier. Go to thesimplifier.com. Register with your name and email. You'll be emailed uh, how to access it with your iOS or Android device along with your individual password. And in it uh, is, it is an event that Mike and I did for $5,000 per attendee. Uh, Russell Brunson was in, in attendance. Jeff Walker was in attendance. Uh, Joel Tyrion was in attendance and a whole bunch of other top marketers. Uh, you get that for free, plus a whole bunch of other interviews I've done with some top marketers. Uh, all my gifts. So go to uh, the simplifier.com, get that uh, app and uh, continue the journey of getting from where you are to where you want to be. Yeah. And I encourage everyone who's listening to this, like go ahead and simplify now. Don't think, oh, well, once I have a bunch of money and once I have a bunch of results and once I have a big business and a hundred employees or whatever, then I'll need to simplify. It's a whole simplification is like attorneys. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot less expensive to invest in it now than after the fact when you really need them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So yeah, check out the simplify. I'm looking at the simplifier.com right now. This app looks super cool. I'm going to, I'm actually going to check it out. Yep. Um, cool. Anyway, thank you again, man. Thanks for being a guest on millionaire secrets. I want to let everyone know um, we actually have something that we put together for our listeners. It's my uh, free download book called the millionaire shortcut. And if you go to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Tom B for Tom Beal, uh, then we'll know that you heard about it on this episode. Go grab your free book uh, for all the listeners of this episode and, um, you know, subscribe to the podcast, all that good stuff. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate the audience being here. Tom, I appreciate you being here so much for an amazing episode of Millionaire Secrets. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.